Welcome everyone to our Black Hat 2019 series of interviews. In this interview, I have with me Chris Kennedy. He's the CISO and VP of Customer Success at Attack IQ. Chris, welcome. Thanks. No relation to Dave. None. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> um, so, uh, Chris, will you want to talk about my, the MITRE ATT&CK framework? And I thought it was interesting as when we were talking just before to prep for this, is that you said like three, four years ago, like no one was really using MITRE ATT&CK. Like what were we doing? Right. right? It seems like there's a very sharp contrast like pre-MITRE ATT&CK and post-MITRE ATT&CK. It's exploded. Yeah. What, why, why do you think it's exploded like that? Well, I think um, there's several reasons for that. First and foremost, um, security operators that um, are in the trench have found a way to communicate more effectively with MITRE mm -hmm. ATT&CK in terms of decomposing what the nature of a threat is, mapping that back to the controls that would protect against that specific threat, and then being able to benchmark and measure is that control effective or not. Mm -hmm. And so by, de by the decomposing of, of the kill chain, and showing what control should protect you within the kill chain, you can then start doing mappings of understanding where you have, <coughs> excuse me, significant gaps mm -hmm. uh, in your uh, in your control posture. Do you need some scotch? I think you need some scotch. I do. I you have I a, a kilt on, so we broke out the scotch. Cheers, and Chris. I Thanks I for coming on Security Weekly. Thank you. And late night last night, so I've got a little bit of my voice. Uh, you know, this remaining. helps amazingly mm -hmm. well. That's awesome. <laughs> so we talk a lot about MITRE ATT&CK today. As if it has been around like forever, <laughs> right? Like yeah. we were lost without it. Um, but there's a continued investment in it. What, what I want us to, to think about and your thoughts on Chris is how do we measure its effectiveness? So now we've got this great new matrix that we're, a lot of people are using. Yeah. But if I didn't have MITRE ATT&CK at some point in time and then I implemented it in some capacity, uh, how do I measure the effectiveness? How did it increase my yeah. security posture? How did it increase my you know, red team capabilities? How did it increase my communications with various teams? Wh what are the measurements and how can we measure the effectiveness of minor attack? Yeah, I'm, I'm on a crusade for this, being, mm -hmm. uh, being in the risk management community for a long time as well. Um, what I think is really interesting about the question itself is, as you mentioned before, that we didn't have minor attack before, so how did we measure mm. before? Um, and the methodologies that we applied were highly subjective, very temporal, um, and we we, hit, we weren't breached. Therefore, I everything was working great. Right. I, I did an <laughs> yeah. audit six months ago. Yeah. It must be working the way I thought it did. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, MITRE ATT&CK affords an interesting opportunity to study that, decompose what your control posture should be based on known attacker behaviors, mm -hmm. and then figure out what controls you actually need. Now, what makes that neat in terms of the measurement capacity of that is that. At the lowest level, Katie Nichols has a wonderful blog about this in terms of getting start with minor, getting started with minor attack. Mm -hmm. Pick and choose um, the controls that you have within your environment and map that specifically to the framework. That's just an assessment of the controls you think you have against the tactics that are used against them. And it sounds really like difficult and tedious to do that, and it, it probably is, somewhat. but it's worth it once you do it. Yes, and once you get over the hump, yep, and then you fold it into your SDLC process and things like that, it becomes old hat. Mm -hmm. And so that's wonderful. So once you've done that, you have an immediate view of what tactics do I have absolutely no coverage for. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a big hole. And then you start thinking about what threats am I most worried about. You can instantly threat model mm -hmm. what threat I'm worried most about, no coverage, priority one activity. Let me go close that gap. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really wonderful way to measure what specific capabilities I need right away. But then through time, uh, what you can do is with uh, capabilities like Attack IQ and what we do, is that if you enable, enable some form of emulation testing to validate the control is working, you identify these gaps, you use the platform and the automation behind it to measure where you have gaps today and where you have gaps tomorrow and show work done in terms of closing gaps. What I love about Attack IQ and the concept of breach simulation is, uh, as I mentioned before, I've been doing a lot of development lately, I really love the concept of agile development. Of course. I think it, Attack IQ allows you to do that style of agile. In other words, I write the test first, yep. I test my application infrastructure, whatever it is, and then if it fails, then I go fix it. Totally. Now I have the test, and I can continually test to make sure that I never have that condition again Absolutely. that could expose risk. Absolutely. We find that many of our customers that have embraced uh, more modern computing methods are folding in Attack IQ for the test harness functionality mm -hmm. to be able to build the unit test as part of a, valid a continuous validation for the particular release and the security mm -hmm. they want built into it, um, as opposed to the more traditional MITRE ATT&CK customer that has a traditional enterprise and is uh, in, is more worried about the traditional risks that are articulated there. 
So uh, yeah, I think attack IQ and the breach and attack simulation concept and having continuous security validation as a core cornerstone of your SDLC process is a <coughs> excuse me is a is a killer app mm. that needs to be that needs to be embraced and I'm excited to see that happening. Agreed. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of lessons from uh, DevSecOps that can be applied to traditional infrastructure, uh, and this this being I think a great use case. And now to have a framework to start building some of those components on top of. Um, is great. So, I mean, that begs the question, <coughs> what is MITRE ATT&CK good for? And what I really want to know, uh, Chris, from your experience is, how are the different sub-teams within an organization using MITRE ATT&CK? Because I'd gather that the red team is using it different from the blue team. I think the blue team is made up of your security division, your sysadmins, your network admins, maybe your help desk, uh, mm -hmm. audit and compliance, right? And even each of those sub-components of blue team use it differently. Yep. Yep. So it all depends on the orientational lens of what you want to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. So as a red teamer, um, you're taking the outside in look of what it would be to be um, to, to be the adversary, and you can take advantage of MITRE ATT&CK as understanding what the common tactics that would be. So you take the threat lens. It's like a map. It's, it's not specifically the code that you'd use to, <laughs> to do that, no. but it's like you should execute the attack this way. Yeah. You go find ways to, and it's uh, a project plan for your red team, right? Fun fundamentally, and I think it a different level, um, if you think about how the red team should approach um, how they actually conduct adversarial activity. It's one thing to be a really good red teamer and know something that no one else does. It's another to apply the risk bias of probabilities to that. Yes. And so, like, I'm going to emulate APT29 because I have indicator of that activity in my environment, or some mm -hmm. of them coming after us. Let me try to emulate what they would actually do before they do as mm -hmm. a red teamer, determine if I've got adequate security to protect it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the what I consider kind of the red team lens and how they would embrace MITRE ATT&CK. The blue team allows you to take whatever the control functionality responsibility is. If I'm the engineering team that runs specific sets of controls, mm -hmm. I can map those controls to MITRE ATT&CK in terms of what tactics and then benchmark and measure the effectiveness of those controls and assign that as a responsibility. PowerShell is an example. Yeah. If I run a Windows network inside MITRE ATT&CK, right, it's telling me that I need to control how, how uh, PowerShell is really important run, right? And it's, it's, it is a very important one. Um, but without that, I just hear people speaking at conferences going, PowerShell can be used for evil, and I dismiss it. Right Now, as if it's part of that, now I can look at my infrastructure and go, wow, either I have zero controls, anyone can run PowerShell anywhere they like, yep. right? Or I can start putting some controls around that. And it gives defenders that framework to say, either I have controls or I don't, and help not really help prioritize, but at least give you a list to prioritize as a team. Right? That's correct. And I really like how MITRE, the MITRE TAC framework allows that story to be told. Yeah. Like once you do that assessment and you start doing that control mapping and you start doing those evaluations, you start realizing I've got some big picture things I've got to clean up within my enterprise. Mm -hmm. I have unconstrained PowerShell in my environment. This is a primary tactic that's used by these specific threat actors. Now I can tell the story to the board or whoever in terms of what my strategy needs to be. I think it's a better conversation with management, too, because you can communicate where your gaps are yeah. and then work with management to help prioritize them and also understand, <coughs> PowerShell is an example, how much work it is yeah. and the potential impacts and then prioritize them, right? Maybe take care of some of the easier things first, right? Yeah. You can almost create a matrix off of it, like level of difficulty and risk to the organization, potential risk to the organization, likelihood of compromise, yep. create a matrix to help you prioritize all those projects. Because I guarantee you, most organizations out there today, from a defender perspective, are going to go, yeah, we're missing all these controls. Mm -hmm. But now you've got to prioritize them, and that's right. a, there's a lot of factors there. It right? is. There is. There's in terms of tech strategy, where the organization wants to go, mm -hmm. what threats are actually relevant to you. Um, but at least you have a framework to then overlay those threat models to actually may have those conversations. Because I tell you, being in the practitioner seat for 20 years, most of those conversations today are driven by fear, uncertainty, and doubt, mm -hmm. uh, egos and who has the most powerful voice in the room. Uh, agreed. And that doesn't solve security. I think the other component that I really like, and I've, I've seen that threat analysts that work for organizations are adopting the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So I think when you look at adopting it, you need to realize that is multiple organizations need to be adopting it all at once. Yeah. Now you have a, a shared framework that you can all use, not to what you're going to attack, what you're going to defend, but then what threats are you going to look at and how that ties back. And if it's all using the same MITRE ATT&CK framework, you're in great shape. Most threat analysts I know today are working, either have worked or working on projects to implement this when they notice an external threat 
where does it map a miter attack and ha where does that map to in my environment? That's the story. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the end-to-end -end story. The, like, threat analyst models the emerging threat they're worried about in miter attack. Mm -hmm. Then he goes to the blue team and says, what controls do I have based on miter attack that this emergent threat is worried about? Hey, red team, go validate those controls are actually yeah. working. Yeah. And that's the So end it's end a, full, a full cycle. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what we're coming to in a maturity level of miter attack is using it for that full, that's correct. That full process. And that's the key reason I came to attack IQ in mm -hmm. that if there's anything I've observed in my 20-year career is that we have a major systems engineering problem in, in cybersecurity. If you're designing an aircraft engine, you would have a whole lot of information and telemetry about the individual components of that engine working and the performance mm -hmm. of it with intolerance. We don't have that requirement yeah. in cybersecurity Yeah, no, it's, today. A, it's a great, yeah. And so now there are, you know, a, a breach and attack simulation platforms that allow you to actually start building that, that continuous assessment of does the current threat I'm worried about today with an emulation validate the control that I have is going to protect us. Mm -hmm. I think it's less and less about <coughs> missing patches. And sure, that's important. Sure. And way more about what are my exposures. Yeah. And exposures were defined pre minor attack by someone gave a presentation at a conference about this new advanced Windows exploitation technique. Right. Someone should have paid attention to that and take that back in. Right. Write some manual tests maybe, right, do some mitigations. But now it can be very much formalized. I think yep. you, you can get a lot of st uh, m momentum in your security program by using something like Attack IQ in conjunction with Minor Attack to do that continual testing. Yeah, think about that point for a second. I was um, I was uh, pulling off the GAO report on Equifax mm -hmm. that was published last year. And uh, that, that attack is often characterized as the, the struts vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You read that report, that the entire kill chain failed. Like yeah. they, did, they didn't the have governance yeah. about sharing information. The, they didn't have architecture established right. The uh, a certificate expired and they lost in decryption capability to actually interrogate traffic for three weeks. Like, like all of those things a were lot part of, it of the was problem. Like what we have here is a failure to communicate. Right? A lot of it was <laughs> communications just not being there, or if yeah. they were communicated, no one was acting upon it. There were them. governance problems. There were operational problems. Mm -hmm. There were incident response problems, and then there were uh, PR problems. Like uh, the whole thing, you know, comes together that right. way. And there's no there's no silver bullet for all of those solutions. But if you have a continuous loop of always trying to iterate and clean up, yes, it's yes. not annually based. Right. And not right. a singular pen test. I think that's one of the things that the uh, biggest mistakes we've made in security is doing that point in time vulnerability scan totally. audit or pen test. Totally. Because it really is just a point. It gives false in comfort. Time. It gives false comfort right? that your program's working. And if you're not testing the processes along with that, you're you're missing out, like you said, in Equifax case, uh, huge gaps. Yeah. They don't necessarily like we didn't apply this patch. Yeah. It's like, well. That's just the entry point. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, all this other stuff failed, too. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. You know, it's uh, um, and it, it's an interesting timeline, time to be uh, a security executive. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the Ponemon Institute, mm -hmm. we commissioned a, a study with Larry uh, to ask a bunch of senior executives with very significant budgets. I think average is $18 million mm -hmm. uh, dollars in security budget and Fortune 500 financials and things like that. Uh, scary. 53% of the respondents which Larry estimates actually be high, said they have limited confidence in their security program. Mm. So what does that mean? What does that say about like that, that gap you just articulated? Right. Like there are problems all around. How do you start tackling, uh, tackling this? And I think it starts first and foremost with adopting that system engineering discipline mm -hmm. of establishing continuous security validation as part of your program. Chris, how do we communicate MITRE ATT&CK and its benefits to senior management? That's a... That's a difficult thing to do, I've found. And one, because MITRE tax new. Mm -hmm. Two, the board um, is familiar with receiving information about the security program. It's largely framed around your common security control frameworks and things like that, the SIS-20. Mm -hmm. uh, I was um, um, reviewing, I think his name is Brian Frick from BBVA. He's got a, a mm -hmm. nice LinkedIn page about how he translates the control maturity assessment to his risk communication mm -hmm. to the board. And it articulates... You know, I, I saw a movement because of how I subjectively assessed the control maturity assessment. And that's kind of scary. So I think one of the things we got to do and the thing that we're, that we're working on within Attack IQ is how do you conduct the mapping of your NIST 853s, right. your ISO 27001 to, atta to MITRE ATT&CK, and then you can actually instrument and illuminate the performance of those control families by mm -hmm. kind of in aggregate adding them up. 
uh, in terms of the performance of them. And so that's kind of a, a future generation of where we want the product to go. So when you're actually measuring and assessing based on MITRE ATT&CK the performance of your security controls through adversarial emulation, mm -hmm. you can then roll that forward and tell a more coherent, simpler story. It says within this control family, uh, endpoint controls, um, I'm grading it a seven because I conducted it, have a continuous set of tests. And if those tests slip and fall mm -hmm. because of a new emergent threat or because of operational failure, right. then it comes down. So it's mapping it into frameworks that executives are already familiar with. I think that's further integration. I think I so. Yeah, I, I, think I don't, I don't think you point. can train the board to understand MITRE ATT&CK. You gotta, you gotta make it simple. You gotta make it punchy. Mm -hmm. and you gotta make it effective to communicate. B more importantly, you gotta make it um, as close to real time as possible because mm -hmm. of the, the volatility of the environment that the board's responsible for securing. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, if folks want to learn more about Attack IQ or get a, a demo or a trial, I don't know if you have such a thing, but yeah. how, how do they do that? Yeah, just come to www.attackiq.com and then uh, you can just register uh, your interest and we'll, uh, we'll reach out to you and work with you for a demonstration. Uh, we're also at Black Hat here in bo booth 2216, so if any of your listeners are on now, come on by and see us. We're here. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much. It was great. Thanks for the time.